is Peter McGaw. I am board member, co-founder of Minorum Gold. Well, we're on track, I think, quite nicely in our exploration strategy at Alamos. Uh, we recognized in our drilling last year that the district was substantially bigger than anybody thought it was, and now we're trying to figure out how big it is. And so we've increased the footprint probably at least three times over the historic perception of the size of the district. We've drilled about 10 out of 15, 16 veins that we can see in outcrop. We're of course getting a lot of blind veins in our drilling, which is very nice, but our goal really is to determine how big this system is, and we still have a ways to go to do that. Well, I think the drilling results that we just released are very positive. Anytime you can put out in a very early stage drill program in a vein district, a meter of 300 grams, that's a successful drill program, and we did that in several of the holes. Um, and some of those are high-graded sections out of much wider intercepts, like nine meters of almost 200 grams. But I like 300 as sort of a threshold for what's really economic. Um, what we know, and, and our goal here was not to find another hole seven. I mean, obviously we would have been happy to have another hole seven. Uh, that doesn't happen to you every day. And so you have to be realistic and understand that recognizing high-grade mineralization in a structure tells you that structure is worth more drilling. Our goal was to get one or two holes in as many different structures as we can to figure out where we want to be in the district. Now we know which some of the structures are that we want to follow up, but we still have hundreds of, you know, thousands of meters of strike length on these veins that we have to continue to explore, looking for where they get wider and where that 300 plus grade gets wider. The beauty to me of the Alamos district is that it is woefully underexplored because it was found in outcrop in this upthrown block in the middle of the district. So the veins were big honking expressions of structures cropping out on the surface. People found them, they mined them down for five, 600 meters. Um, we now recognize that except for that central block, and I shouldn't call it central because we don't even know if that's the middle of the system, but outside of the historic block, we have veins exposed at a much higher level, and so this isn't a question of doing any more than going in where people have mined before. This is going after totally virgin veins, or they've maybe got little peckings on the surface of them. So these veins that we find, we're not going after leftovers. These will be entire new intact veins with no, that haven't been high graded. This thing has never been thought of as a big coherent district before. And that's the real key to what we're doing moving forward. One of the things we've learned from a recent fortuitous discovery of old data, which we did not have, is the recognition that the principal ore shoots in the historic part of the district appear to have been two, maybe 300 meters long horizontally. You know, they, were, they were mined for four or 500 meters to depth, but that means that in any vein, and, and these things open and close like sausages, in a link, and you, and you want to find them where they're fat. But if you know that that sausage is 200, 300 meters long, and your vein is two or three kilometers long, it's very easy to see that your initial holes are as likely to go into a, a narrow neck between sausages as it is to go in a sausage. Well, the next round of drilling is to continue doing what we're doing, which is we still have half a dozen veins that we have not yet drilled, and we need to get some holes into those so we understand what the limits of the system are. Then we can start thinking about which ones of the veins that we've already hit are prime targets for going back and doing some more drilling along the length of the structure. It's way too early days to go back in and start drilling right around really good results. I mean, you don't ignore that, but you're not trying to offset these things by 50 or 100 meters. You're talking about offsetting them by 500 meters or 1,000 meters along the structure to try to find where they get fat. The, the $64,000 question that everybody asks is, when are you gonna offset hole seven? And my answer to that, and I'm only one member of the technical committee, is that we shouldn't do that until we have figured out more about the dimensions of this system. That uh, having another hole like hole seven that's drilled 50 meters away from hole seven does not really advance our understanding of the system the way I think we should be doing and focusing on at this point. Obviously, we will go back and 
try to prove up some mineralization in that area. But we don't even know if hole seven is the best hole that we can pull on this property. It is narrower than the stopes in the historic Cantera mine. So even that, for as good as it is, is not as good as we know it can get in the district. So why would you stick to that until you have a better idea where things might be better? Well, we do have a bunch of rocks. Yes. And they're from the eastern part of the district. Yeah. So this is a part of the district that we've really only begun to explore seriously during the latest campaign. Right. So remember that we have the upthrown block here, which is where Quintora and Promontorio are. So this is the strip that basically is where the Correct. historic production came from. And this is the this Promontorio. Is up, so, that's, that's on the, so everything over here is dropped down relative to that. Correct. And we have to yeah. move the core a little bit to see the, the Quintera vein here. Right. Yeah. And so everything here is dropped down. Correct. So this yeah. was where the, the district was found in outcrop in the 1600s. Yeah. All the historic focus was there, except for prospecting on some of these other structures. Right. And because these other veins were exposed at a much higher level from these, they were basically overlooked. Right. So what we're doing right now is to try to figure out, first of all, what really is the footprint of this system, yeah. where the best part of it is. Just because that part got thrown up doesn't mean that's the best part of the system. So right. the temptation is to call it the central part of the district, mm -hmm. but we don't really know if that's the case. We don't even know if those are the best veins. Mm -hmm. But what we have here are samples of multi-stage epithermal veins from this eastern part of the district. And epithermal is just a fancy word that means shallow. Yeah. So it's it's surface heat. Uh, so it's, it's hot fluids that rise along a crack they get close enough to the surface where the pressure in those fluids can't be contained by the rock, so they boil violently, like popping the top off a bottle of beer. Right, right. Not like putting a pan of stove on yeah, yeah. water on the stove. Yeah, yeah. And it's that process of pressure drop that causes first the base metal and silver minerals to deposit, and then quartz deposits after that, plugs everything up again until the system builds up pressure and it happens again and again and again. And what you want is as many of those cycles as possible. So when right. you're evaluating these veins in surface outcrop, you're picking up pieces of float right. and trying to figure out, you know, it, did this particular vein see even at a high level, does it show me evidence of multiple stages? Right. And these do. Here's a beautiful example of a vein that was mineralized and broken and then remineralized. You can see all this banding of quartz around these individual fragments. And some of these fragments are actually pieces of vein from an earlier stage that were ripped up and in turn wow. remineralized. So this is telling us good things. The fact that it's weeping copper oxide is also important because yeah our silver mineralization here is intimately linked to copper. The high-grade silver mineralization is a mineral called stromyorite. Right. And here's a and really high-grade example of this. This is from the Cantera The Cantera, mine. correct. So yeah. this is stuff yeah. that would have been historically mined. Right. And this is mostly the mineral stromyorite, which is just composed of copper, silver, and sulfur. Interested. Stuff like this. And so you can see this is weeping a little copper oxide here, the blues and right. greens. The blues, yeah, the but green, this yeah. gray that you see all through here, that's the same mineral, but finely divided. And oh, so this is more typical. So this piece probably only runs two or three kilograms silver per ton. Right. Wow. Which is still very high grade. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you know, I like to use about 300 grams as an underground mineable cutoff right. for yeah. Mexico. So when I see our drilling results and we're getting a meter of 300 grams, that's a successful hole as yeah. far as I'm concerned. Yeah. That's telling you this system can make the grade you need. It's getting close to making the thicknesses that you want. Right. So it's telling you I'm in the right place. Well, People haven't necessarily focused on these. There's gold here. Yeah. We don't understand the systematics of where the gold is. We don't rec we don't understand enough about the system yet to know which parts of the system have more gold, where the gold is, why it's there. Yeah. Now we're starting and to see in in holes in this area, we're starting to see strong base metals. So this is right. this is 15% zinc and 5% lead with a couple of ounces silver. Wow. So this is much lower silver, very high base metals. This is probably a deeper portion of a vein relative to some of these others that are higher. But we still don't have enough of the pieces to know 
what's going on. But yeah. what we are seeing is that we have pieces that are all worth putting together. Yeah. Things. And oh, that's, yes, that's, correct. Yeah. That's an important part of the story right. because a lot of these veins were so close. We're so, we're so far above the top of most of these veins right. that there's dozens of them that don't make it to the surface. Or right. Didn't make it, or a better way to look at it is the surface hasn't worked its way down to the top of them yet. Right. And how about this uh, particular rock, the El Tigre? El Tigre? The El Tigre this is, it's another example. This is a beautiful multi-stage, it's, it's basically quartz with fine grain silver copper sulfide. And where's the silver here? Well, it's again, it's this gray metallic gray stuff metallic in here. Stuff. It's, okay. uh, you know, until you know what you're looking at, it's not that exciting. Yeah. But when you see that much of it, I mean, this is of another course. piece of rock that's going to run multiple kilograms yeah. of silver. Mm -hmm. A zinc mineral, but some of this white stuff is too, and the lead is is all spread out in there as well. And that's 15% zinc. 15. Wow. One five, 15 percent. Yep. Amazing. And about five percent lead. Great. Great. Well, thanks, Peter. Thanks for all your insight and the update and looking at these rocks. It looks like uh, we're going to be busy for for quite a while here. We are. Yes. <laughs> and we'll have more. We'll have more fun with it. Too. Yeah, absolutely. Well, if you want to find out more about uh, our animals project, please visit our website at monorum.com and uh, I'll be more than available to answer any of your questions. Peter, thanks again, okay? Always a pleasure, sir. All right, cheers. Take care.